Chapter Two of The Man Who Found Out a Nightmare by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. It was in February, nine months later, when Dr. Laidlaw made his way to Charing Cross to meet his chief after his long absence of travel and exploration. The vision about the so-called Tablets of the Gods had meanwhile passed almost entirely from his memory. There were few people in the train, for the stream of traffic was now running the other way, and he had no difficulty in finding the man he had come to meet. The shock of white hair beneath the low-crowned felt hat was alone enough to distinguish him by easily. "'Here I am at last!' exclaimed the professor somewhat wearily, clasping his friend's hand as he listened to the young doctor's warm greetings and questions. "'Here I am, a little older and much dirtier than when you last saw me.' He glanced down laughingly at his travel-stained garments. "'And much wiser,' said Laidlaw with a smile as he bustled about the platform for porters and gave his chief the latest scientific news. At last they came down to practical considerations. "'And your luggage, where is that? You must have tons of it, I suppose,' said Laidlaw. "'Hardly anything,' Professor Ebor answered. "'Nothing, in fact, but what you see.' <laughs> "'Nothing but this handbag?' laughed the other, thinking he was joking. "'And a small portmanteau in the van,' was the quiet reply. "'I have no other luggage.' "'You have no other luggage?' repeated Laidlaw, turning sharply to see if he were in earnest. "'Why should I need more?' the professor added simply. Something in the man's face or voice or manner, the doctor hardly knew which, suddenly struck him as strange. There was a change in him, a change so profound, so little on the surface, that is, that at first he had not become aware of it. For a moment it was as though an utterly alien personality stood before him in that noisy, bustling throng. Here, in all the homely, friendly turmoil of a Charing Cross crowd, a curious feeling of cold passed over his heart, touching his life with icy finger, so that he actually trembled and felt afraid. He looked quickly at his friend, his mind working with startled and unwelcome thoughts. "'Only this?' he repeated, indicating the bag. "'But where's all the stuff you went away with? And have you brought nothing home, no treasures?' "'This is all I have,' the other said briefly. The pale smile that went with the words caused the doctor a second indescribable sensation of uneasiness. Something was very wrong. Something was very queer. He wondered now that he had not noticed it sooner. The rest follows, of course, by slow freight, he added tactfully and as naturally as possible. But come, sir, you must be tired and in want of food after your long journey. I'll get a taxi at once, and we can see about the other luggage afterwards. It seemed to him he hardly knew quite what he was saying. The change in his friend had come upon him so suddenly, and now grew upon him more and more distressingly. Yet he could not make out exactly in what it consisted. A terrible suspicion began to take shape in his mind, troubling him dreadfully. "'I am neither tired nor in need of food, thank you,' the professor said quietly. "'And this is all I have. There is no luggage to follow. I have brought home nothing, nothing but what you see.' His words conveyed finality. They got into a taxi, tipped the porter, who had been staring in amazement at the venerable figure of the scientist, and were conveyed slowly and noisily to the house in the north of London, where the laboratory was, the scene of their labors of years. And the whole way Professor Ebor uttered no word, nor did Dr. Laidlaw find the courage to ask a single question. 
It was only late that night, before he took his departure, as the two men were standing before the fire in the study, that study where they had discussed so many problems of vital and absorbing interest, that Dr. Laidlaw at last found strength to come to the point with direct questions. The professor had been giving him a superficial and desultory account of his travels, of his journeys by camel, of his encampments among the mountains and in the desert, and of his explorations among the buried temples and deeper into the waste of the prehistoric sands, when suddenly the doctor came to the desired point with a kind of nervous rush, almost like a frightened boy. And you found— he began stammering, looking hard at the other's dreadfully altered face, from which every line of hope and cheerfulness seemed to have been obliterated as a sponge wipes markings from a slate. You found— I found, replied the other in a solemn voice, and it was the voice of the mystic rather than the man of science. I found what I went to seek. The vision never once failed me. It led me straight to the place like a star in the heavens. I found the Tablets of the Gods. Dr. Laidlaw caught his breath and steadied himself on the back of a chair. The words fell like particles of ice upon his heart. For the first time the professor had uttered the well-known phrase without the glow of light and wonder in his face that always accompanied it. "'You have brought them?' he faltered. "'I have brought them home,' said the other, in a voice with a ring like iron. "'And I have deciphered them.' Profound despair, the bloom of outer darkness, the dead sound of a hopeless soul freezing in the utter cold of space seemed to fill in the pauses between the brief sentences. A silence followed, during which Dr. Laidlaw saw nothing but the white face before him alternately fade and return. And it was like the face of a dead man. They are, alas, indestructible, he heard the voice continue with its even metallic ring. Indestructible, Laidlaw repeated mechanically, hardly knowing what he was saying. Again a silence of several minutes passed, during which, with a creeping cold about his heart, he stood and stared into the eyes of the man he had known and loved so long, ah, and worshipped too, the man who had first opened his own eyes when they were blind, and had led him to the gates of knowledge, and no little distance along the difficult path beyond, the man who, in another direction, had passed on the strength of his faith into the hearts of thousands by his books. "'I may see them?' he asked at last, in a low voice he hardly recognized as his own. "'You will let me know their message?' Professor Ebor kept his eyes fixedly upon his assistant's face as he answered, with a smile that was more like the grin of death than a living human smile. "'When I am gone,' he whispered, "'when I have passed away, "'then you shall find them and read the translation I have made. "'And then, too, in your turn, "'you must try with the latest resources of science at your disposal to aid you "'to compass their utter destruction.' "'He paused a moment, and his face grew pale as the face of a corpse. "'Until that time,' he added presently, without looking up. I must ask you not to refer to the subject again, and to keep my confidence, meanwhile, absolutely. End of chapter 2